Let's begin with a prayer and then try to catch up for a little bit from yesterday. Uh, we were in Genesis chapter 3, but let's say for our prayer a bit of Psalm 119. Um, I'll start in verse 70. One. It is good for us that we have been afflicted, O Lord, that we may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to us than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Amen. We were, uh, when we were finishing last time, we were right at this great riddle of Genesis 3.15. I suggested to you guys that this is the, uh, the pro, it's called the Proto-Evangelion. It's the first gospel. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, I think I did suggest to you guys yesterday, did I not, that this is perhaps the most important verse in the entire Old Testament? And so we want to spend a little bit of time unraveling it and make sure we get our head around it. Now, remember, remember what had happened. Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were tempted by the serpent. They ate the fruit. They saw that they were naked. They put together their fig leaf religion. You know, they invented their, their own works righteousness. They heard the footsteps of God. They ran and were hiding. And then the Lord comes and he finds them. He talks to Eve. He talks, to, uh, he talks first uh, to, uh, to Adam who told you you were naked? Did you eat the fruit? And he says, the woman that you gave to me. Can you, can, now just to hear the anger in Adam's voice. The woman that you gave to me. Adam hates Eve and he hates God. Ah! And then he turns to, the Lord turns to Eve and says, what have you done? And she says, the serpent deceived me. So then he turns to the serpent. Now we want to notice that in Genesis 3, 14 and 15, there are two things that are cursed. This is very important. Two things are cursed. And it's not Adam and Eve. It's the serpent and the ground. It's the serpent and the ground. Now, Adam and Eve are given difficulties, but the serpent and the ground are cursed. So the Lord turns to the serpent. He says, you'll go on your belly uh, all your day. You'll eat the dust. And then we get to this particular text. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay. Now we want to understand what's going on here. I, who's the I that's talking? That's God. I will put enmity. Is that how to spell enmity? Enmity. It looks funny to me. Uh, what does enmity mean? It means, it means uh, warfare. It means bitterness. It means discontent. It, it means that you're going to be enemies of, of one another. So that God is saying that I will make enemies out of you and the, and the woman, out of, out of you and Adam. I'm not, cont I'm not content for Adam and Eve to be at peace with you, the devil, but I'm going to start a war between you and the devil. And, and in that word, enmity, we see a great promise. Because if God is going to put enmity between us and the devil, he's going to put peace between us and him. In fact, it, it, you, you, you see how the Lord finds Adam and Eve hiding in the bushes with the devil, and he says, why are you so close to each other? Why are you friends with each other? I'm not, I'm not content with the situation. I'm going to put you at war with one another. So I'm going to make a war between you and the woman, and then between your seed and her seed. That is, the devil's seed and the woman's seed. Now, the devil, we know, cannot have children. The devil and the angels are spiritual. They're spirits. They neither are married nor given in marriage. Uh, there's no little baby demons. That would be... Uh, there's a, we don't have to worry about it because there aren't any. So. Uh, so what are we talking about when it says the seed of the devil? Well, the, what, what does the devil produce? The devil produces sin and death. That's what he's after. He's a liar. He's a thief. He's a murderer. He's trying to create havoc and chaos. He, his offspring is sin and death. So the Lord says, I'm going to make also a war between sin and death and her seed. Now, this is the key person to identify. The seed of the woman. Now, now nowhere else in the Bible does it ever talk about the seed of the woman. Every other place we read about this in the Bible, it's the seed of the man, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of Jacob, the seed of Judah, the seed of, of David. A seed belongs to the man. The Greek word for seed is spermata. 
you see what is going on there. But look at what it says, the seed of the woman. Now that's a strange, strange thing to say. In fact, God is indicating here that this one who is going to be born of a woman is going to be born without the help of a man. It's a little, it's a little hint at the virgin birth. Uh, we don't know that the woman will be a virgin yet, but we know that this child will be born of a woman without the help of a man. And I've capitalized the seed here because this particular seed is Jesus. Now, how do we know that? Look at what it says next. He, that is this seed, shall bruise or crush, maybe is better, shall crush your head, your, the devil's head, and you shall crush his heel. It's the picture of a of a man stepping on the head of a snake. And as he steps on the head of the snake, the snake bites his heel and he crushes down and breaks the devil's or the serpent's head. Now this crushing or this bruising is to deliver a death blow so that both the seed and the serpent will die, but they're a different kind of death. The serpent is crushed in the head while the seed is crushed in the heel. In other words, the seed will receive, will, 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 will be given a death, a death blow that doesn't end in death. In fact, it's kind of amazing that we have already here in this text the idea that the seed will die but not stay dead. And in his dying will crush the devil. And even more. We know that maybe Adam and Eve in their perfection could have resisted the devil. They could have, they could have resisted his temptation. But this seed can do more than resist the devil. This seed can actually destroy the devil. Do you see that? He can destroy him. Now we know nobody can destroy the devil but God himself. And so we see in this verse already that the promised seed of the woman will be, in fact, God in the flesh. That he will have the authority to destroy the devil. It's an amazing text that all this is here. And in fact, we have, we have little hints that, that Eve, uh, that Eve and, and Adam both understood the text. In fact, when Seth was born, Eve says, I have begotten a son who is the Lord. So that Eve was expecting that her child would be God in the flesh. But we see already from this text the full promise of the gospel. Adam and Eve, can you imagine that Adam and Eve, after hearing these words, could have basically confessed the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered, died, raised, the one who overcomes sin, death, and the devil for us, the one, the, the, the one who, will, who will rescue us from death and the devil, it's already there. Now, this is important because I think we, we often have the idea, and we don't read the Old Testament right when we think this way, that if you just think that if Adam and Eve, whatever, for whatever reason, if they came to Gothenburg and they were going to go to church, we, we, like, we assume that they would go to the synagogue and not to the Lutheran church. No. If Adam and Eve or Noah or Moses or King David, if they came to church, they would come to your church. They would confess what you confess. They believed in the Holy Trinity. They believed in the Incarnation. They believed in the substitutionary atonement. They believed that Jesus, that the Messiah was going to be God in the flesh to die for you, to rescue you from sins. They knew that you're saved by grace through faith and not through works. This is all through the Old Testament. In fact, Peter says it like this in Acts chapter 10. He says, all the prophets preached that the forgiveness of sins would come through the name of the Messiah. All the prophets, that is what they preached. So that this doctrine, these chief teachings of Jesus, of his person, of his work, of his death, and of his resurrection, and of the forgiveness of sin by grace, this is what the Old Testament is about from the very beginning. And this is the fountain from which it flows. This is like, the, this is like a, if you start at the base of the river and you chase it all the way up to the headwaters, the spring where the waters come out of the, out of the ground. This, this verse right here is the headwaters of the gospel and from this all the grace flows in the, all through the Old Testament. So we see, you can trace it by the, by the word, right? You see the word, the seed, 
And you can trace that seed coming all the way through the Old Testament, the seed of Abraham when he's called, and the seed of Isaac, and the seed of Jacob, and the seed of Judah, and the seed of David. That promise is coming all the way. Now, the stunning thing for us, the stunning thing for us is to recognize this thing that we ended with yesterday, and that is that, that not only that not only would Adam and Eve have death because of their sin, but that now God himself will die because of their sin. And that's indicated by the thing that happens next. Because remember, the very next thing that happens in the text is that the Lord takes an animal. I don't know what it was. Maybe it went extinct because there was only two of them, and now the Lord killed one. Maybe it was a unicorn <sighs> or a lamb or something, and the Lord takes an animal and he kills it and he, and he cuts the skin off and he takes that skin. Can you imagine this being there? Still warm, still with the flesh and the blood on it, and he wraps that skin around the naked bodies of Adam and Eve. That's a group. I, I remember one time I, uh, I was, we were on a retreat with my son and his class. Uh, it must have been fifth grade. So that would be like 10 years old. And so I was in this cabin with a bunch of boys and we were up in the woods at this camp and there were some elk hunters uh, that were using one of the cabins next to us. And I woke up in the middle of the night, it was maybe one in the morning, and there was this racket. And so I went and looked outside, and the hunters, they had, they had killed an elk, and they had, and they had brought it back, and they were, they were cleaning it. They had hung it up on the tree, and I thought, this is great. I'm going to take these city boys <laughs> and show them this. And so I woke all these kids up in the middle. I bought guys, come on, you got to see this. And they put their shoes on. They're in their pajamas, you know, 10-year-old boys. And follow me. Get our flashlights. We go over there. We walk around the corner. And here's this elk hanging up. And the guy cuts open. And the, you know, the entrails fall out. And they all go, blah. <laughs> and we stood there. And I said, can we watch? Sure. And so he goes. And they, they start to skin it, you know. And you, and here's the blood and the, and the, and, the, and the guts and the, and the skin and the muscle. And it's, a, it's uh, it, you know, you've seen this. It's, it's ugly. I want you to imagine that in the garden. I mean, this is the first blood shed ever. And, it's sh and the blood is shed by God himself, who takes one of his creatures, an innocent creature, uh, absolutely, who didn't do anything at all, and takes that creature in his hands and breaks its neck and hangs it up from the tree and pours out the insides and cuts off the skin and takes that skin as Adam and Eve watched with horror on their faces and he wraps, he takes off the fig leaves and he wraps on the skin and the blood. And Adam and Eve would with horror, no doubt with horror, think to themselves, maybe even ask, is this what, is this what it takes to cover our sin? This horrible thing? This kind of death? And God would say, oh, no, it's, it's much worse than that. It's not the death of this animal. It's, in fact, my own death that will cover your sins. This sacrifice of this animal and this skin wrapped around the nakedness of Adam and Eve is a picture, it's a preaching of the death of Jesus, which is to come. And I think we can understand that every sacrifice all throughout the Old Testament is the same thing. It's a preaching of the death of Jesus that is to come. The death of God that will cover your sin and your shame when the fig leaves can't do it, that it takes the blood and the skin of the sacrifice. And then Adam and Eve are, are removed 
are removed from the garden. Now, this would have been a, a horrible day for Adam and Eve, no doubt, but also a wonderful day. Because while they're removed from the garden, they are not removed from the kindness of God. In fact, they know the kindness of God more wonderfully than they ever had. Okay. Now, this, now, now, now this is... I want to, to kind of take it back, and I want to maybe make five... I want to make five points about this to try to, to drive it to our theme of, of truth and love. But we want to see how the devil... Comes to, comes to Adam and Eve and is trying to pull apart truth and love. In fact, the devil is making the argument that God is a liar and that God is not loving. But we, I want you to see so clearly in this promise and in this act that God is both true, that he tells the truth, and that God is love. So here's five things to think about with this. Number one, the truth and the love that are under attack by the devil are a very specific truth and love. The devil is not attacking truth and love in abstract. The devil doesn't come to Adam and Eve and say, is it true that gravity makes the planets orbit? <laughs> he doesn't come and say, is it true that the, the amount of potassium in bananas is not good for you if you eat too many? I don't know, actually know if that's true or not. But just... Or the devil doesn't come to Adam and Eve and say, is it true that things are true? In other words, there's a very specific attack that the devil brings to, to Adam and Eve. It, did God really say... The devil attacks the specifics of the Word of God. One of you pointed this out to me. We were talking about it as we were walking around sometime in the last couple of days. Is that the same thing happens in the life of Jesus? Remember that when, when the devil comes to tempt Jesus, he, t he tempts Jesus to doubt a very specific Word of God. God had said to Jesus in his baptism, You are my son. And then the devil comes to Jesus in the wilderness and says, If you are the Son of God. Do you see? So that the devil, when he attacks the truth, is attacking a very specific truth, the truth of the Lord's word, and he's attacking a very specific love. The devil attacks the love of God for Adam and Eve. God, he says, does not love you. Otherwise, he would want you to eat the fruit. God does not care about you. Otherwise, he would want you to be like him and have your eyes opened. So that the devil's attack on truth and love, this is the per first one, the devil's attack on truth and love is not in the abstract, it's in the concrete. The devil attacks you at the same point, at the point of God's word and the point of God's love, his love in Christ for you. Point two. The devil attacks... And I couldn't sleep, not, last night I slept, but the night before I couldn't sleep real well because I was trying to figure out how best to say this point two and point three. I still, I haven't figured it out. Maybe not sleeping actually didn't help me figure it out. But we'll, we'll try, and you guys can tell me uh, if we're getting there. The devil, point two, the devil tempts us to doubt God's love by opposing it with our own truth. And point three, because they go together, the devil tempts us to doubt God's truth by putting against it our own love. Let me, let me try to say it. See how I would... <laughs> let me try to say it uh, as simply as possible. The devil attacks God's truth with our love and our affections. And the devil attacks God's love with our own thoughts and reasons. So that there's a truth that God spoke. You shall not eat of the tree, but the devil uses the desires and the affections of Eve to stand against the truth of God. So he puts, in, in that way, the love, the fleshly love of Eve against the divine truth of God. Eve sees that the fruit is good for food 
and so she desires to eat of it. And this is the same way that the Lord works, or that the devil works to, to convince us to not believe now. He says, you have the truth of God in the Ten Commandments, but he puts your desires against that truth so that the, the devil sets our own sinful love against the truth of God and says, well, don't you want to do that? Don't you desire that? Don't you long for that? Whatever that sinful thing is. So God's truth doesn't matter because you have these affections and desires. Now, we're going to talk more about this in a little bit. And then on the other hand, the devil tempts us to doubt God's love for us by setting against it our own reasoning and our own understanding. So that God loved Adam and Eve, that's why he gave them these commandments, but the Lord, but the devil tempts them to doubt this by saying, no, the Lord doesn't love you, otherwise he would have done this. So he sets our false reason against God's love and he sets our false desires against God's truth. Or, maybe to say it another way, he puts our wants against God's will, and he puts our will against God's wants. He assaults God's word with our false, with our lusts and desires, and he assaults God's love for us by our own false reason. So that the devil, as he tries to separate truth and love, he, he, he sets them against each other and weaponizes them. So that one, so so that we 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 pursue our love against God's word, and we pursue our reason against God's affection. I don't know if that makes sense, but I want to I want to we'll maybe talk about it in, when we get to the Ten Commandments. But I want to I want you to meditate on that and and maybe take it even uh, one step further. And that is that. Uh, that just like the devil attacks the concrete truth and love of God and he uses the, our lust against God's truth and he uses our reason against God's love, uh, we want to recognize then in the end that it is only the truth of God's love that saves. The, there's a lot of things that are true but there is only one truth that saves, and that is the truth of God's love for us in Christ. So just as we saw how the devil's attack was specific, we want to be very specific about this, that Christianity is, Christianity is a pursuit of the truth, but it's the pursuit of a very specific truth. It's like 104 degrees in Paris today, I just said that to make you feel better. <laughs> it's not too far behind. Oh, you don't do Fahrenheit. What, 104 degrees is like 73 Celsius, I think. It's, it's very hot. 37? 39? So it's supposed to be like the Sahara Desert in Paris, right? That, that might be true, but that truth does not save you. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that are true, but there's one specific truth that saves, and it is this. It's the truth of God's love. The truth of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So while we say that we, as Christians, that we pursue those things that are true, it's not a general blanket uh, uh, pursuit of the truth. It's the pursuit of the truth of God's love that saves. Okay. Well, look, let me. You guys, if you have those four points, we'll we'll kind of wrap it up there as a reflection of how the how the devil uh, tempts Adam and Eve in the garden. And and I and I want to move on to a, a conversation about the Ten Commandments. Now, uh, we talked about this a little bit. So maybe the next slide shows Moses uh, there. He, this is Moses smashing the Ten Commandments. Remember, he got so mad, he came, he, got, he, he came down from the mountain, and he had the Ten Commandments in his hands, and he sees the people are worshiping Baal, and he says, what are you doing? And he crushes the Ten Commandments. Do you know the old Lutheran theologians said that the invention of, of written language was the Ten Commandments, that before God had etched the commandments on stone, there had never been any words written down. That was the idea of Chemnitz. I don't know if I agree or not. I mean, I'm not sure. I don't, 
I like the idea, so I want it to be true, but I like, there's other ideas that I like too that I can't quite figure out. We don't know for sure. But can you imagine even how precious that, I mean, the first written letters in the whole history of the world, and Moses is carrying them. It's the law of God. It's his eternal will made known to man, and he's got them on these two tablets, and he comes down, and he, and he sees the golden calf, and he throws it down, and this whole big thing starts, and he ends up grinding the golden calf into dust, and the people who were worshiping it have to drink it, and all the people are slaughtered, and then Moses is laying in bed that night, and his wife is next to him, and, and she says, you maybe shouldn't have broken the commandments. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about that right now. <laughs> I maybe went a little overboard there. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the Lord gave these Ten Commandments to Moses. It's really quite beautiful. And I think that we can do well to meditate more on the Ten Commandments. In fact, uh, the, uh, uh, Martin Luther in the Large Catechism this used to really puzzle me. If you, if you take the large catechism and look at the large catechism, you'll notice that probably two-thirds of the large catechism is about the Ten Commandments. And then one-third of it is about the creed, the Lord's Prayer, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. Like, two-thirds on the Ten Commandments? Luther, you're a legalist. You know, don't you care about law and gospel? Look at all this law. And I, I puzzled over that forever and ever and ever as a pastor. A baby pastor, I couldn't figure it out. Why did Luther spend so much time? But, but the more you read it, the more it starts to make sense because Luther will say things in the large catechism like, whoever understands the Ten Commandments is ready to do anything in this world. He's ready to be a judge. He's ready to rule. He's ready to be a king. He's ready to, he's ready to uh, you know, be a businessman, to be a, to be a writer, to be in charge of anything at all, to be a pastor in the church. Luther says that the entire book of Psalms is a meditation on the first commandment. Wow. Or, he says, that when we understand the Ten Commandments, we understand the whole Bible. Now, now, uh, that, that, now that is incredible. Because we, I think, think of the Ten Commandments as... Uh, look, I got four points here. We think of the Ten Commandments as like these little list of rules... In fact, I've, so I've got four things I want to suggest to you about the Ten Commandments that I have written down here. And the first one is this, that we need to, un, we need to expand our understanding of the Ten Commandments. Do you guys have, like, um, I would notice that, uh, yeah, we, we would have had it at the hostel. Now, like, if you go into the breakfast room in the hostel, you go, and there'll just be these list of rules. Like, oh, yeah, as you're going into the hostel, it has rules. Like, no booze. No loud noise after 10 o'clock. If you lose your key, call this guy. Stuff like that. There's, I always remember, think of it like if you ever go to places and there's a swimming pool and it has these list of rules and they always seem very arbitrary, like no glass bottles, no swimming for an hour after you eat, no, no running, no, you know, it's just a list of the things that you're not supposed to do. Uh, and I think we think of the Ten Commandments that way. It's like a list of the things that you're not supposed to do. Hey, uh, don't misuse my name, and also, you know, don't take stuff from people. And it's just a, like, a, like a list of do's and don'ts. Now, we need to expand our understanding of the Ten Commandments to as, as much, much more than that. In fact, I think that maybe in the way into this is to understand that in the Ten Commandments, the Lord is protecting the things that he's instituted. I remember one time, so when we were growing up, we had our back fence behind our house was the city limits. And it was in Texas in the hill country and there was these hills that were behind our house like this. And so I had two little brothers and we would just run all over the hill, we called it the hill, as if it was the only one in the world. You know, I guess it was for us, it was the hill. Mom, we're gonna go play on the hill. And we'd go on the hill and play. And as we get older, we'd go farther up the hill. We got to the top of the hill. We, in fact, then went to the bottom of the hill. And as we got older, we said, Mom, can we go to the second hill? And this was a big day. Mom says, sure. So we went down the first hill and up to the top of the second hill. And as we came to the top of the second hill, we saw on the third hill a huge white tower. Just in the middle of nowhere, this white tower. What is that? 
And me and my brothers sat on the hill looking at that tower, wondering what that could possibly be. And we knew it was important because there was a big fence around it with barbed wire. We, can't, we sat there and we thought, well, maybe it's a missile silo. You know, and if we, go to, if we go to war, there'll be a missile shooting out of here to protect the country. Or maybe it's a secret underground ninja training base. Or, I mean, who knows? What we, I mean, we just imagined it, but we knew it had to be important. So we sat there and talked about it. We came back home. Mom, 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 can we go to the third hill? I guess so. Back, back, back. And we got up to it, you know, kind of looking for landmines, <laughs> creeping along, and we got up, to, and we couldn't, we, but we, I knew, we didn't know what we were, we, we knew we were in the presence of something really important, and so what did we do? We sit there, we looked at it, we listened, and then we started throwing rocks at it, <laughs> because that's what 10-year-old boys do, I guess. But the point is that we knew that something very important was there because there was this fence around it protecting it. It was a water tower, by the way. I mean, <laughs> I mean a, a secret underground ninja training base is cooler, you know. But the fence indicated that it was something important. Now, I want you to think of the Ten Commandments in that way. That the commandments are like the Lord putting up a fence around the things that are important. I am your God. That's important. And so the Lord puts a fence around it to make sure that no one messes with that. You have my name, and you have access to me in your prayers. You can stand before me and ask me for the things that you need. That's important. And so the Lord puts a fence around it. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. You have my word, which forgives your sins and makes you holy and gives you rest from all the striving to make me happy. And that's important, so the Lord puts a fence around it. You shall uh, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You live in a family and, a, and, and you live in a society that has order and it's an order of gifts and provision to support your life. And it's important, so the Lord puts a fence around it. Honor your father and your mother. You have life, and that's important to God. And so he puts a fence around your life and says, you shall not murder. You have your sexuality, and if you're married, you have your spouse, and that's important. And so the Lord puts a fence around it and says, you shall not commit adultery. Do you see? You have stuff, or some of you do. <laughs> I always thought, you know, we sing this, Luther teaches us to sing this hymn, uh, take they our life, goods, fame, child, and wife, let these all be gone, they yet of nothing one. And I, I think now how easy that was to sing when you didn't have any, I didn't have any goods, fame, child, and wife. Then it's like, well, all they can take is my life. But the Lord gives us fifth commandment gifts, and then he gives us sixth commandment gifts, and then he gives us fourth commandment gifts, and then he gives us seventh commandment gifts. And now, now, now that, that becomes tougher every year to sing. And Luther didn't include his grandchildren in it. That would be the toughest of all. Take they our wife and child and grandchildren. Let's keep those. Anyway, we, uh, the Lord gives us stuff. He gives us the privilege of putting our name on a thing on a piece of land, on a piece of, for the sake of the family, for the sake of marriage. He, he gives us private property and he puts a fence around it and says, you shall not steal. The Lord gives us the gift of, a, of the ability to make promises. He gives us the gift of a good reputation and it's important to him. So he puts a fence around it and he says, he says you shall not bear false witness or give false testimony against your neighbor. And the Lord gives us a profound contentment, rightly ordered desires in the heart. And that is important. And so the Lord puts a fence around it and says, you shall not covet. So the Ten Commandments are, are God protecting his gifts to us. Do you see that? Now that's wonderful and really important. And in fact, if we start to see the Ten Commandments this way, then, then we can start to really reflect on what the gifts are, and the gifts of the Ten Commandments are God's ordering of the world. 
If you want to know how the, how the Lord has created the world, we see that ordering of the world in the Ten Commandments. God has ordered the world so that his word would go forth. God has ordered the world so that we live in family and we live in state. God has ordered the world so that there's life and there's marriage. Now, this is so, so fantastically wonderful to us because we know that the devil, when he attacks us, is attacking the institutions that God is protecting with the commandments. And when you sin, that's the devil enlisting you to attack the gifts that God has given. Now think about this. When you sin, the devil's enlisting you to attack these gifts. When you tell a lie, it's an attack on the Lord's gift of truth. When you gossip about someone, you're attacking the gift of their good name. When you steal, when you're lazy at work and all this sort of stuff, you're attacking the gift of, of, of property that the Lord has given to someone. So the devil is enlisting us in these attacks. And not only is the devil enlisting us in attacking, but he, the devil is also enlisting us in being attacked. It's, one of the, it's very interesting, I think. It's one of the things we've got to wrestle with because, it, because we often think, as, especially as Lutherans, it, we're very good in thinking of our own sin against other people. That's what we do when we come to confess. We confess our sin and our guilt against other people. But, but one of the things we also need to wrestle with is what do we do when people sin against us? What happens then and how do we treat it? But so these gifts of God are under attack and the Lord wants us. That's why he sets us to live a life according to the Ten Commandments is to live a life in his gifts. In other words, as we, as we uh, study and meditate and, and by the power of the Holy Spirit attempt to live according to the Ten Commandments, we're attempting to embrace all of the gifts that the Lord has given us in creation. That they're, that they're there because God loves us. That's why we have them. In fact... The, the love, love is going to be the whole summary of these commandments, and I think that's point two. How are we doing on time? The heat makes it slow down, doesn't it? Are we doing okay? 20, oh, perfect. So here's point two. Point one was we need to expand our understanding of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are protecting God's gifts and expose how God has ordered the world. Point two is this. Love is the summary of the Ten Commandments. I think we have a Bible text uh, to look at. Uh, this is Romans. This is one example. Remember, remember they come to Jesus. The lawyer comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, uh, what's the greatest commandment and how does Jesus answer him? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, Jesus, what does he say? Love God and love the neighbor. That's the summary of the commandments. The first table of the law, the first three commandments is summarized, love God. And the last seven commandments, honor your father and mother all the way to you shall not covet your neighbor's donkey, that's summarized in love your neighbor. And so the, the, the basic idea of the law is love for God and love for the neighbor. Do you, guys have the, um, do you guys have these dehydrating machines? Do you know the dehydrating machines? My grandma has one. So it's like a, it's like a trays, and they have a fan in it, and you just put stuff in it, and it dries it out. It shrinks it down. So like you put grapes in there, and they become raisins, and you put plums in there, and it becomes prunes, and you put meat in there, which is the best, and it becomes jerky. And you put bananas and they become these like, like little plastic kind of, you know, checkerboard banana things. And it dries it down. That's a dehydrator. If you put the Ten Commandments in the dehydrator, you would go whoosh, into love God and love your neighbor. It's like the Ten Commandments that spent too much time in the sun. And that's what Paul says. No, owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, and then he lists them in the text. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. And if there's any other commandments, Paul acts like he forgot them. I had a catechism student show me that text, and he says, even Paul can't remember the commandments. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's got them. For the commandments, and he lists them, and if there's any others, are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19, the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Love. If you want a one-word summary of God's law, it's this. 
love. Now this is both fantastic and terrifying. It's fantastic because love is fantastic. And it's terrifying because love demands everything. Love demands everything. There's not a, there's not a single time. Can you imagine if this is what, if you, do any of you keep like checklists, if you're students especially, you know, you got to do this assignment, you got to read these pages, you got to do, maybe you're at home, you got to do these chores and you check them off at the end of the day and you feel good because you can check them off. But look, at, as soon as love enters into the equation, you can never check it off. Take out the trash, do the dishes, love my neighbor like myself. Love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, there's something there, isn't it? Because love sounds to us like this soft kind of beautiful word. Love, it's all about love, 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 love. But love will kill you because love cannot, our, love cannot ever be kept perfectly. It cannot be fulfilled. It cannot be done. It cannot be checked off. It cannot be satisfied. It demands everything until at last we're dead. Greater love has no man than this that he lay down his life for his friends, says Jesus, so that love is a giving all the way to death, so that that command to love will always accuse us. The command to love will always hold us guilty before God because which one of us has done it? When Jesus and Paul are unfolding the Ten Commandments in terms of love, they're not softening the law, they're sharpening the law. You know, it's one of these things that we think of the Pharisees as like these guys that, like the Ten Commandments were here, but the Pharisees were like here. God gave Ten Commandments and the Pharisees added 603. So it was harder to keep the commandments. But that's not, what the, that's not what the 613 commandments of the Pharisees did. It didn't make the law of God harder. It made it easier. Now, not for everyone. The Pharisees know this trick. They want to adjust the law so that the law is doable and keepable, but only for those who have d dedicated their lives to live like a Pharisee. It's like, um, <laughs> it, it's like when, uh, it, it, when I was little and my brothers were you know, littler, and we'd go to like the amusement park. And you know at the amusement park they have the line that says you have to be this tall to go on this ride. You know what I'm talking about? Like the, we walked by that crazy amusement park and all those crazy people screaming, like dropping. I think the amusement park is not amusing. And the older I get, the less amusing it is. It's like just, it's like what fun is it to just, to get as close to death as possible without dying? Like to go on the roller coaster? Why is that fun? I mean, I used to like it, but I'm an old man now, and I'm dizzy for days afterwards, and I'm... Anyway, so I'd go with my brothers to the amusement park, and they'd say, and here's me, and here's my brother, and here's my other brother, and they'd say, how tall do you have to be to go on that ride? And I'd say, this tall. <laughs> you know, so I'm in, but they're not. Now that's what the Pharisees did. How righteous do you have to be to get into heaven? This righteous. You're not there, are you? Huh? You're not nearly as righteous as I am. But they didn't, ex they, they lowered it. They had this external understanding of the law. The, the, God commands rest on the Sabbath day. That means we give ourselves over to the study of the Lord's word. And they say it means you can only take 210 steps or whatever. God says you, uh, he says, you love your neighbors yourself. And they say, well, th well, that means your neighbor is the Jewish people, but not the Samaritan ones. So that their laws were actually pulling the command of love down so that they could keep it. So that they had a lower standard. Love does not lower the standard of the commandments. Love raises it. It blows the roof off of it. That's what Jesus is doing when he preaches the law. Remember how Jesus said, you've heard it said you shall not murder, but I say if you call your brother a fool, you've murdered him. You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery. I say if you look with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery in your heart. Jesus is not lowering the standard of the law. He's raising it. And he says it like this, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes or Pharisees, you, you can by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Now, I just think about being a Pharisee in the, in the audience, listening to Jesus say that. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you can't enter heaven. They would be like, yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> Because Jesus, at the one, it complimented them and insulted them at the same time. They say, look, they are the most righteous of the righteous. And yet they are not righteous enough. The Lord, when, when we understand the Ten Commandments in, the terms, in, in terms of love, it, just, it, it raises the standard so high that none of us can keep it. I remember we were walking around at seminary, and we were, we were trying to sort out law and gospel, and we said, and we realize that if you take a single word, you cannot determine if it is law or gospel. I mean, you take a word like love and you say, is love law or gospel? And the question is, well, it depends. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's law. But God loved the world that he gave his son. Now that's gospel. But this word, this commandment, this summary of love and the law is really, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a raising of the standard that the Lord has for us. Now, we understand it, though. We understand that the essence of the law of God is love. And the devil understands that as well. And this is going to be our third point. And that is that the devil wants to put love against the commandments. So rather than understanding love as the fulfillment of the law, the devil wants us to see love as the goal and the law as the obstacle. Now this is how that temptation uh, comes about. You've, this, this is how this goes. I remember especially when I've worked with youth, and the youth always have this question because, at least in America, they're dating each other. Uh, and they have this question, well, so, okay, so we're dating, but we know we're supposed to be chaste. Uh, we know we can't, we're, not, we're supposed to be chaste until we get married, but we don't want to be. <laughs> so, you know, how far is too far? What can we do? Where do we cross the line of chastity and so forth? And is it, is it wrong to act like we're husband and wife? And this is the, how the question goes. Is it wrong to act like we're husband and wife? After all, we love each other. We love each other. Now, how interesting, how interesting that love is brought in as an excuse to break the sixth commandment. Because we love, it's okay to be, un, to be unchaste, to fornicate. Or this comes in in the, uh, in the question in, in the United States about abortion. I don't know how the abortion argument is around here, but the abortion argument is, is done under the idea of compassion. Here you have an unwanted pregnancy, and don't you love the mother? Don't you have compassion to legalize abortion? We talked about it a couple of days ago. We heard about it in the sermon today that the idea that two men can be married to each other, the, the, in the United States it was the Supreme Court decision of three summers ago, the Obergefell decision, that legalized homosexuality, a homose legalized homosexual marriage in every state in the United States. And the argument was, how can anybody limit somebody else's love? You have a freedom to love. So that love is used in the devil's scheme of things against the sixth commandment, against the institution of marriage, against the institution of life, and so forth and so on. In fact, in fact, doesn't it come to us this way, that whenever the church preaches the commands of God, the accusation is that we're not loving, that we're being hateful, that we're being closed-minded, that, that we don't have compassion. Now, how, how can it be that love is a summary of the law, and yet the devil is so able to arrange things that he uses love against the law? But that's what he does. He sets love against the law. Love wins. Do you love me? And he does this both individually and also institutionally. Now, we might, 
Let me just say a quick word about this, and then you guys ask me later if you, wanna, if you want me to talk more about it. Because the devil will tempt us both as individuals to break God's commandments, but he'll also tempt us institutionally to break God's commandments. And he does it always under the angle of a utopian society. The devil will come along and say, hey, you know the best way to have no adultery is to not have marriage. You know the best way to end theft is to end private property. You know the best way to make sure that kids don't rebel against their parents is to end the family. The best way to make sure that nobody ever breaks their marriage vows is to have no marriage at all. And so the devil tries to, to, tries to cloak uh, the idea of righteousness and love under the breaking of the institutions of God. Okay, uh, you guys think about that. I, I just want to pass on that because here's our last point and I think we're getting to the end here. That the way we fight against the devil's setting the Ten Commandments in opposition to love is understanding that the Ten Commandments give shape to love. And maybe to, to make the basic point like this is that love looks differently according to your vocation. So, let me get you guys back together. If I were to tell you guys, hey, uh, later I'm going to take you guys and I'm going to get you all new pairs of shoes, you would say, wait, <laughs> that's weird. You're not my dad. <laughs> you, I guess you guys probably buy shoes for yourself. But, you're, but you're, my, the, the love that I have for my children probably looks like me buying them shoes. It's a fourth commandment shaped love. It's not the love that I have for you, which is a third commandment shaped love. The love that I have for you is that I stand here and try to deliver as well as I can the truth of the Lord's word. Because we're here in the Lord's church and we're doing these churchly things. So a third commandment shaped love is very, very different than a fourth commandment shaped love. Do you see that? Or a sixth commandment shaped love is very different than any other love. The way that the husband loves his wife and the way that the wife loves her husband is very different than the way you love anybody else. The way that you love God, first commandment, is very different than the way you love your parents, fourth commandment. And the way you love your parents is very different than the way you love your neighbor, fifth commandment. In fact, the way you love your neighbor is also very different than the way that the soldier loves his enemy. That's the fourth and fifth commandment as well. So that there's a different shape to love, and that love is shaped according to the commandments. We, 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 in other words, we can't make love into an abstraction as an as expression of our desires, but rather that we, we understand that love is shaped according to the place that God put us. So that we have the command of God, love my neighbor, but then the question is how? What does that love for my neighbor look like? Does it look like staying up all night with them when they're sick? Well, that's the way that the love of a father or a mother is for their child. Or does it look for, does it look for uh, me paying the right amount for my, for my uh, coffee when I go to the store? Well, that's a seventh commandment, love, for my neighbor that's there. In other words, love looks differently according to the commandments. So that the way that we protect ourselves from the devil's assault of putting love against the commandments is recognizing this, that the Ten Commandments give shape to our love. So as the devil, and here I'll summarize with this idea, as the devil tries to pull apart faith and love, we, we, uh, or pull apart truth and love, we want to recognize that the Ten Commandments put truth and, and form back into our love. Okay? All right, I'll, tell, I'll end with a story. And this probably doesn't have much to do with it, but it's kind of funny. When I was your age, if you are 19, <laughs> I was riding in the back of this little four-wheel drive thing in the outback of Australia. And I was asleep. And uh, we were driving along on these corrugated roads, bouncing along. And the, the girl who was driving lost control. And we went into the side and flipped over like this and landed on the roof, bounced to the, and kind of landed on the hood, 
rolled over again, bounced over this termite bed, and then kind of came to a stop spinning on the roof like this. I still remember it because I woke up as we were in midair. So the, like the jolt would have... And so I, I kind of come out of my groggy sleep and think, this is weird. <laughs> it feels like I'm floating. And then all of a sudden, uh, it was poof, and the glass goes like this whoosh, across my face. And then the dust was coming in. Whoosh, and I thought, whoa. And, uh, and we came to a stop. And apparently we had a Beatles tape that was playing in the radio. And so I still remember we All you need is love. <laughs> and I thought to myself at that time, and an ambulance. <laughs> It, it's not all you need is love and the Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's the idea. I better tell you what happened, right? So I had a, apparently I, I undid my seatbelt and I fell on my head and I got a cut on my head with a glass. That's as bad as it got for me. And I crawled out the side and I, I asked the two people in there, I said, are you guys okay? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And one guy broke his wrist. Uh, the girl who was driving had like a, just a, I mean, she broke her neck, but, it, but in the form of like a tiny little fracture, so she had to wear a neck brace for like three days. So no big deal. So everyone was fine. The car was totaled. We flipped. This is the weirdest. But, the, but, I, but I got out, and I get on the radio, and I'm trying to call the other cars that we're with. I'm like, we flipped the, we flipped the truck. We flipped the truck. And the guy hears me, you're stuck in mud? <laughs> and, and he drives up, and I hear him cursing on the radio. Oh, no. Uh, a little more expletive. And then... And then I got out, and I'm bleeding all in my face like this. I look like I'm like from Vietnam or something. And I take my shirt off, and I tie my shirt in a bow on my head. And, it's, and so I'm there with my shirt tied around like this, and I'm kind of running around. Ah. And we flip the thing back over. This is the weirdest thing of all. We flip the thing back over, the car back over, and we open up the hood so we can disconnect the battery. And there in the engine compartment is my shoe. So I'm like, I don't know how that got there, but it must have somehow gotten off my foot, out the window, flew through the air, bottomed the engine, flipped around and got in there. And I thought, well, I'm glad my foot wasn't in it. Uh, but then we were fine. But it was, how about this? It was six hours to meet the ambulance halfway to the hospital. We were really in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but everyone was fine. It's the reason why uh, I can't wait to go bald because you'll be able to see proof of it. I'll have this big scar on it. Uh, but I always remember that thing. All you need is love. That, so that's, that's the point you got to remember. All you need is love. And the answer is that's what the devil says. All you need is love. We got to say, all we need is love shaped by God's law in the Ten Commandments. Okay? Good. Okay, we'll finish there. We'll say a prayer. And then uh, I'll let you know tomorrow. So the Ten Commandments give, give, put truth back into love. And tomorrow we want to reflect on Jesus before Pilate who puts love into truth. And so we'll think about that tomorrow. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we give you thanks that you protect your gifts by the Ten Commandments. We thank you that you give shape to our love according to our callings and vocations and according to your Ten Commandments. We pray that by your Holy Spirit we would meditate on these commandments and that they would give shape and grounding to our love for you and for one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.